Hello everyone and welcome to HST 1032M, uh, which today's lecture is going to be on representing the past in the epic film. Uh, to introduce myself, I'm Andrew Elliott. I'm a senior lecturer in the School of Film and Media, where my work is mainly on video games, on television, on film, and medievalism more generally, and where most of my work explores the ways in which uh, history is represented through uh, various modern media. So in today's lecture, I'm going to start off by focusing in particular on the epic film. Now this potentially is problematic. It could suggest um, that that is the only form of uh, historical film worth exploring, or it might suggest they're privileged towards Hollywood or towards the US in general. Those aren't my intentions. That's not what I'm actually here to suggest. Uh, what I am going to look at is the epic film as one of the most effective and perhaps most prominent ways that people will come into contact, maybe even accidentally, with a representation of the past. So over the course of today's lecture, I want to look at a number of things, but I'm going to start off by thinking about the historical epic film as, and this is my slides here, a form of public history. Uh, so in that first, uh, in, uh, first onslaught, within a minute or two minutes of this talk, uh, I'm already becoming quite controversial, and I do so deliberately. But I'm not necessarily suggesting that it is a form of public history. I want to challenge very, very uh, early on in this lecture whether or not we can see it as such, because whether people realize it or not, a lot of people are seeing or suggesting uh, that historical films should be taken seriously or should be criticized or should be subject to the rigorous questioning of historians on the basis that it acts as though it's a form of public history. So uh, looking at um, other modules, uh, other weeks, sorry, in this module, you might be looking at things like museums or you might be looking at um, television or video games, as you will be with me uh, later on in the semester. Um, or you might be thinking about TV documentaries. Uh, in each case, what I'm suggesting is that these are considered to be forms of public history. Um, if we consider, for instance, the quotation, uh, the first one on this slide from Baird Seals, which says that much of the world's population knows what little it knows of history from these movies. Uh, this is the introduction to a non-scholarly text from 1990 where he's talking about epic films. But there is a scholarly text just below it uh, from Gary Edgerton and Peter Rollins, two very, prom very prominent TV and film historians. Uh, respectively, in a book called Television Histories, Shaping Collective Memory in the Media Age, which again we're going to take as a provocation, uh, who argue that television is the principal means by which most people learn about history today. So if we take those quotations seriously, what we can see is that there is a suggestion underpinning most of those arguments that somehow or other we need to take these films quite seriously because the public are taking them seriously. And therefore, if they misrepresent a particular historical era, then somehow the public, by a process of osmosis that no one's actually bothered to, to elaborate, somehow members of the public will themselves also inherit this idea about the past. So let's start by challenging this. Let's think start. First of all, it is absolutely true that we are possibly these days more inclined to think about history in a visual sense, or at least the visual representations will be an incredibly important part of the ways in which we think about the past. My suggestion is that isn't particularly new if you think about visual culture through the last sort of however many millennia where we have records of it and even before. I don't think there's any reason to think that sudden, somehow we suddenly underwent a hugely visual turn. But nevertheless, we are, and this is a, a quotation I quite like by Martin Winkler, who wrote a book on classical myth and culture in the cinema. We are, as he says, a civilization now accustomed to thinking in images. And he says, it's the visual work of cinema, videotape, mural, comic strip, photograph or something that is now part of our memory and I'm very interested in thinking about that part of our memory as part of our visual memory um, and and therefore what that would mean for us so is there any evidence that this is actually the way that we think um, I've moved over sorry to the next uh, slide that about engagement with the past First of all, it's worth mentioning that there are very, very few studies, uh, fewer than a dozen, um, very few studies which actually explore how people go about 
consuming the past and how people really do engage with the past. A lot of these kinds of studies tend to be undertaken by museums, by cultural institutions, um, by those who have a vested interest, obviously, in measuring visitor numbers and what kinds of things people learn in museums and what they take away from it and so on. Um, but very few broad scale studies have actually measured and no longitudinal ones have measured how people go about engaging with the past, with the exception of one um, large scale study by Rosenzweig and Thurland, which took place in 1998 and surveyed, I think, 1,000, it may have been 3,000, but certainly a reasonable number of Americans in the 1997 to 1998 period. They did these surveys by simply calling people up um, on their landlines, if you remember such a thing, uh, and asked them whether they had done any of the following 10 activities in the last 12 months. So the percentages that they came up with, and all of their data is actually available through their website, publicly available, and their website is called The Presence of the Past, just like the uh, title down at the bottom here. Um, so the uh, let's take the first one first. Uh, the percentage of people who had looked at photographs with family or friends, 91% of them had done so. Um, taken photographs uh, or videos to preserve memories, 83% had done so. Uh, watched any movies or television programs about the past, 81% had done so. Um, attended a family reunion or reunion of some other group of people with whom you have a shared experience, 64%. Uh, visited any museums, uh, history museums or historical sites, 57%, and read any books about the past, 53%, participated in any hobbies or worked on any collections related to the past, 39%, looked into the history of your family or worked on your family tree, 36%, written in a journal or diary, 29%, and finally participated in a group devoted to studying, preserving, or presenting the past was only 20%. Now, what we can take away from this is... Uh, something quite interesting. If we look again at those percentages, if we look at which ones of those categories we would classify in any sense as a kind of historical act, we can see that those are very few. Um, I mean, it's quite interesting that Rosenzweig and Thelen actually initially thought that maybe uh, looking into the history of your family or working in your family tree would be a traditional historical approach. Most historians, I think, would probably reject that as a classically historical approach, a classically historical approach. Yet uh, 36 percent. So, you know, essentially one in three had done so in the previous 12 months. Looking at photographs with families or family or friends as 91 percent is a very common activity. But again, is only very loosely in terms of a kind of an oral history approach, maybe, or a kind of a, a personal history approach, uh, what we might necessarily think of about representing the past. But I want you to focus in again on that third category. 81% of people had watched films or television programs about the past. And I think that is almost certainly uh, going to have changed in the last uh, in the last sort of 20 years since this um, survey has been undertaken, particularly to include things like video games, which uh, I've done some work on and I'll be presenting a lecture on that uh, later on in the semester. So if we, have, if we know that 81% of people have attended uh, or somehow engaged with the past in one way or another, what does that mean? Does that mean we need to then take it seriously? No, but it does mean that these are immensely popular ways of representing the past. But it also means that there are a number of problems which are being hidden beneath these data. And those are the problems I want to think about the, over the course of this lecture. I mean, to examine only a handful of these, we come up against a series of common complaints. Um, for instance, that the historical film in general, the historical epic in, in particular, are always seen, and this is my uh, bugbear, as somehow inevitably accurate, inaccurate. Um, for instance, we could think about um, what crusade historian Jonathan Riley Smith had to say about Kingdom of Heaven, the uh, 2005 film, um, about... Uh, how he felt it was going to affect the real-time, real politics or real geopolitics of Arab nationalism and Islamism. Um, so he says that, uh, this is all a quotation, uh, Kingdom of Heaven will, it was in a review of Kingdom of Heaven in the Times Online, Kingdom of Heaven, he says, will feed the preconceptions of Arab nationalists and Islamists. The words and actions of the Liberal Brotherhood and the picture of Palestine as a Western frontier will confirm for the nationalists that medieval crusading was fundamentally about colonialism. On the other hand, the fanaticism of most of the Christians in the film and their hatred of Islam is what the Islamists want to believe. At a time of interfaith tension, he says, nonsense like this will only reinforce existing myths. So it's fairly clear um, from what he's saying here that he's quite 
uh, quite vociferously against the film uh, and suggesting that the film is nonsense, historical nonsense, which is likely to reinforce those myths. And the implication, he, he, what he's very clearly implying uh, here, is that that will somehow have an impact on um, the kind of Islamism we'd seen um, occurring from 2001 to 2005 in kind of very complicated ways related to the war on terror. The problem, of course, with that is um, that the film, the review of the film that he was publishing, uh, actually came out before the film was even made, and therefore before Riley Smith had even seen the film. And this is the kind of the bit I don't want to be, that to be some kind of aha moment, but I want us to to pause and think about how that could actually happen. The essential problem is not only the possibility, or perhaps even fact, that films somehow uh, end up distorting the truth, but we must also take into account our attitudes towards historical films, and we need to be honest about those attitudes. So Robert uh, R. Rosenstone, who's one of the foremost scholars in the field, um, uh, in the field of historical film, uh, offers this rather poignant observation about our attitudes to historical film. He says, to accept film, especially the dramatic feature film, as being able to convey a kind of serious history, which wonderfully he calls history with a capital H, to accept that runs against just about everything we have learned since our earliest days at school. He says, the, the belief is, in, this is the part in red, the belief is, history is not just words on a page, but it's pages, and film is just entertainment. Now, I find that a really interesting and powerful quotation. Um, it comes in a book that's called History on Film, Film on History, uh, from 2006, uh, which is a, a, one of the most interesting books you can read about historical films. And I, I'll put it, a link to it in the bibliography, um, which we have in the library, the, the book we have in the library. I'll put the link in the bibliography so you can um, maybe follow that up, because if you're interested in any of this, that's the guy who you need to really start reading. Um, but it's quite interesting if we think about that to accept it as uh, to accept film as a kind of a serious history goes against everything we've been taught. So when we come to examine the historical epic, as we do here, um, we have to be honest about those attitudes in the first place. It's common and kind of normal as his, as um, historians and scholars to to be on the lookout for anachronisms or inaccuracies or just pure waffle. And it sometimes can be useful and it's almost always really good fun. Um, but that's not the whole story. And more importantly, it's not what I'm going to argue the most interesting way to approach them. And, and that's basically the crux of this argument here, if you take nothing else away, that the accuracy approach is the least interesting thing you can really realistically say. So here, uh, to counter that idea about accuracy being the most useful way of approaching them, uh, in no particular order, is five of the biggest problems I see of accepting films as history. Problem one is how to use good facts, and good is in uh, scare quotations, scare quotes. I don't like these kind of bunny ears, but it, it, how to use good facts uh, when those facts themselves are in dispute, and that is the function of history. The second is that uh, films are designed to entertain, not to educate. Uh, and so therefore, to hold them to account for not educating when they didn't set out to do so is slightly unfair, I think. The third is that the assumption that audiences learn history through these fictional depictions, and therefore they somehow bear responsibility for getting the facts right, um, which, again, I don't suggest that they do. Uh, either get them right or have the responsibility to do so. Uh, the fourth problem is that the translation from the written word to the image necessarily involves invention. And the fifth one is that ideological concerns uh, mean that the filmmaker risks di distorting the past. And for some reason, the word past has completely disappeared from that slide there, but it should be there. Um, all of these five problems, in one way or another, then pose a central problem. And, and as a function of that central problem, what we see they're doing is they're putting facts on the one side and films on the other. But my point is that we shouldn't do that. We shouldn't assume either that the facts are incontrovertible and that they are the, the, the kind of the preserve of the historian and their their property, nor should we assume that anyone who is not a professional historian doesn't know anything about the past. Um, or indeed, should we shouldn't presume that all historical errors are the same thing. And so that's sort of essentially where I'm going to go in this uh, in this lecture. And perhaps in order to illustrate my point, it's easier to use uh, a specific example. 
So here we can take a great example of what happens to history in the epic film in the form of um, Mel Gibson's Braveheart made in 1995, uh, which is a, nowadays a notorious film, notorious for its kind of inaccuracy or, or wild imagination and so on. I'm not going to, uh, we're obviously going to watch the film as part of your screening, um, which we'll be doing, I guess, through Teams or online. I'm not sure how, how that's actually going to happen. Um, but we can watch the film online as part of the, the set viewing. But I want to examine here the first two minutes of the film. Uh, and so you can actually see uh, precisely what happens here. <laughs> I shall tell you of William Wallace. Historians from England will say I am a liar, but history is written by those who have hanged heroes. The King of Scotland had died without a son, and the King of England, a cruel pagan known as Edward the Longshanks, claimed the throne of Scotland for himself. Scotland's nobles fought him and fought each other over the crown. So Longshanks invited them to talks of the truce. No weapons, one page only. Among the farmers of that shire was Malcolm Wallace, a commoner with his own lands. He had two sons, John and William. I told you to stay. Well, I'll finish my work. Where are we going? McAndrews. He was supposed to visit when the gathering was over. Can I come? No. Go home, boy. I want to go. Go home, William, or you'll feel the back of my hand. Go <laughs> home, William. Now, you... I'm sorry, I thought I had an audio problem there. Um... You may not have noticed them all. Uh, that was uh, one minute, uh, one sorry, two minutes of footage. So just uh, over a hundred seconds, I think, a hundred and three seconds. And you may not have noticed them all, but in those one hundred and three seconds, or actually, if we take the full credit sequence, one hundred and thirty-seven seconds, you've witnessed no fewer than eighteen historical errors. Uh, that is, if you're interested in statistics, one error every 7.6 seconds. And in the voiceover, you saw there were 39 seconds and 12 errors in uh, in those 12 uh, those 39 seconds of voiceovers. Um, now, there isn't time to go into each one, but I want to look at the 12 most obvious errors in order to kind of get a sense of where these films are going wrong, how they're going wrong, and whether or not it really matters. So again, it's sort of my... Um, perhaps controversial approach. So um, let's start off with the sequence that you just, that you heard before you even saw anything as you were rising up over the mountain. You heard bagpipes. Now that's historical error number one. Um, the bagpipes isn't quite right. Uh, there is sort of some evidence for bagpipes in Spain in the 13th century. Um, there's very little evidence for their use in Northern Europe before the 18th century, and this is supposed to be set, obviously, in the 13th century. Um, the earliest mention is in 1380, which is 100 years later, in the Canterbury Tales prologue in line 565. But nevertheless, even so, the bagpipes that you're hearing here in the intro is, I'm told, by uh, one of our colleagues in music who is actually uh, a specialist in bagpipes, so that's quite reliable. Uh, this is the Great Highland bagpipe, which we actually only know about anything about from the 19th century onwards. So we know for a fact that there were no bagpipes uh, and that that sound that you're hearing isn't quite right. Um, 
The second mistake is it took place amazingly in the wrong place altogether. So um, where you saw in that um, sequence, you saw the uh, the fort with the loch up here in Fort William. This is the loch that forms part of the Caledonia Canal. So being as off in Inverness, and you've got here, it's kind of uh, just coming down here. You've got uh, Loch Ness, and then Loch Lochy, Loch Oich, and so on. Uh, so there's Loch Lochy, Loch Oich here, and then uh, here is Fort William. This is the mountain that you saw. Uh, actually, what we know is that uh, William Wallace was from Paisley, which uh, this was supposed to be an animation so the arrow would have ended up here. But Paisley is all the way down here, just uh, outside Glasgow, right there. Um, the difference is Fort William is a beautiful hilly area of the Highlands. Uh, Wallace is from Paisley, where the tallest hill is, and this is the tallest hill right there, is nearly 800 feet, which is a quarter the size of the hill that you're seeing here. So it's, it's taking place completely in the wrong area of Scotland. The third uh, is quite an interesting one, is 1280 AD. Uh, now, it may seem strange for me to be criticizing the filmmaker who can set the film whenever he or she wants. Uh, but actually, this is important because 1280 AD in Scotland is quite a significant date. It marks the beginning of the wars between the Scots and the English, which provide the impetus, therefore, for Wallace's rebellion, which obviously is the entire premise of the film. Now, in reality, historically, there was a 13th century struggle between the Scots and the England, but 1280, of all the times you could have picked, 1280 was actually a relatively peaceful time, and it had been so for over 60 years. What's interesting here is that the background to this uh, struggle is that Edward I didn't impose himself on Scotland until 10 years later, until 12, 1290, and we're going to hear in a moment how he was actually invited to, be, uh, to impose himself on Scotland uh, to judge on the claimants of the throne. Um, and in fact... Uh, the person he eventually does choose, uh, John Balliol, who doesn't really appear in this film, uh, is used as a puppet king. The chronology, however, is completely problematic, and we'll see in a moment why. Uh, this is uh, point four. The beginning of the narration says that historians will call me a liar. Now, it's not just English historians who will call you a liar, but all historians, including the numerous medieval Scots chronicles, who uh, don't mention any of the supposed facts proposed by the film. And then there's a history is written by those uh, who hang heroes. History is written by those who can write rather than those who hang heroes. And that seems pedantic, but is a really important point, because by sort of suggesting that all history comes from England, he's actually negating the autochthonous Scottish chroniclers who are writing things down at this particular moment. So it not only does one thing of making the English seem like the outright villains of the piece, which they may or may not be historically, and that's a, a, a bigger story, but actually it implies that the Scots were kind of very primitive peoples who weren't, uh, who weren't a written culture or a literary culture, which is simply not the case and is actually ideologically a little bit suspect. Points five and six are quite interesting. He says in this one, um, uh, this one uh, subtitle here, it says the king of Scotland had died without a son. Now, really important, in 1280, King Alexander III was not dead. Uh, he died in 1286. Moreover, moreover, his sons, David and Alexander, were not dead either. Uh, so he, he didn't die without a son. He didn't die, and he had two sons. He also had a granddaughter, Margaret, who eventually would become his heir and would be acknowledged as such, and she didn't die until 1290. I admit there's a problem here with a dynastic succession, but it's not a problem in 1280. The next one is seven. Uh, Edward the Pagan, a cruel pagan, as the subtitle suggests, known as Edward the Longshanks. So he was called the Longshanks, uh, and he was called Edward. Uh, he may have been cruel, uh, and indeed there is some suggestion that he was. He was not a pagan, though. Uh, Edward was not a pagan but a Christian king. Why the film would say so is really an odd choice here. England had converted to Christianity well over 300 years beforehand, so it's not even uh, something that might be in doubt. Uh, point eight is the usurpation, who Edward the Longshanks claimed the throne of Scotland for himself. Edward I, the Longshanks, did not try to claim the throne uh, during any of this. In fact, uh, he particularly didn't try to claim the throne in 1280 when the king had died without a son because the king hadn't died and did have two sons. So there was no claim to throw, uh, no throne to claim in the first place. Um, when eventually it would come the case for him to be invited to Scotland, as I, intended, as I uh, intimated before, as I intimated before, he established a court case to try to legally resolve the problem. And this was in 1290 to 1292, so 12 years later than the film actually makes out. And eventually he would pick John Balliol as King of Scotland, but he picked him according to established rules of primogeniture, so using the Scottish rules of inherit, um, inheritance. In themselves in order to establish what he proposed was a legitimate king. Again, that is not without its problems. I'm just saying he's not a usurper. Uh, 
says there's a war with England. Uh, Scotland's nobles fought him. Uh, the Scots did not fight the English over the crown and its usurpation, basically because there was no usurped throne to fight over in the first place. There is no record of any armed conflict between Scotland and England in this period up until 1296 when Balliol rebelled. Wallace rebelled a year later in 1297. So, of course, there were periods of oppression and the brutal occupation of Scotland that was kind of an ongoing project, but it had not been going on for 17 years, as the film suggests. But by the time Balliol rebels in 1296, and uh, Wallace rebels in 1297 is not even 12 months old as a kind of uh, official outright war. Um, the Scots did not fight the English over the crown and neither did they fight each other over the crown. Why? Because there was no crown to fight over because the king was alive so there was no need for a civil war since it wasn't at all contested in the first place and even if it had been there would have been established rules of primogeniture to put the, uh, the rightful uh, heir in its place. The, the point 11, where Longshanks invited them to talks of a truce, there were no peace talks. Have a guess why. Because there was no war to have peace talks about. And even if there had been talks, it'd be super unlikely they would take place that far north in Scotland, even in Paisley, but uh, in the north of Scotland, where they're, proje where they're suggesting it took place, uh, where the uh, English would be exposed and unprotected. Um this is a big one, number 12. Malcolm Wallace uh, was a farmer of that shire. Uh, this is a big one. Well, uh, William Wallace's father was no farmer. He was a knight who held lands, and that's quite big. Also, bizarrely, his name wasn't even Malcolm. It was Alan. Uh, so there we are. 13. Uh, there were no tartans. No one really wore plaids, mantles, kilts or tartan until well into the 16th century. And in any case, there's no evidence that anyone ever really wore them uh, in that way over their heads. Um you know, the evidence would be difficult to find, but it, uh, it, it, we would have found something that would indicate that was a, a common way of viewing, of wearing them, and that simply isn't the case. Uh, the weird hairstyle of um, the young William Wallace is an, an odd one. There's no evidence of this kind of mullet in the late 19th, uh, 13th century, either among the Scots or anywhere else. They did have scissors and they did have combs. And we don't really hear of any need to put fur or feathers or objects in their hair as far as they know, as far as we know. And if they had done so, uh, it probably would have been some kind of mention uh, in contemporary chronicles. Uh, uh, sorry, and that's that's 14. Uh, and I've uh, got a couple more. The uh, the other the long term one is the chronology of William Wallace um, going on to. Uh, then sleep with uh, the Queen of France, uh, sorry, the Queen of England or the Princess of England, who marries Edward II or who will become Edward II, uh, which uh, doesn't really work because of the chronology uh, again established by that 1280 AD. So, uh, if we think about it, um, the idea, the 1297 occupation would have then gone on, um, gone on later, and basically Isabella would have been about between three or six years old when she's supposed to have conceived and carried uh, the child of William Wallace. So it just doesn't work. Um, so this is a, a fairly comprehensive kind of um, undoing of just the first two minutes of Braveheart. And so we know that if that's just the first two minutes and then the film continues, there are some serious problems of historical accuracy within Braveheart. And, and we know that that's true. Uh, uh, and it might be sufficient those two minutes for you to then dismiss the entire film as pointless waffle and go about your day. As historians, you're trained to look for the facts and to reject deviations from these core known quantities as some kind of unforgivable error or maybe kind of um, laziness. But my argument here is that we actually shouldn't, because I think this approach can lead you astray and can lead you to a fundamental misreading of what we need to think about in terms of historical accuracy and how to do history through film. This approach um, can lead you to some really stupid examples, in fact, of pointless criticism, such as a comment on uh, Gladiator on the IMDb uh, reviewer um, forums. So I'm going to show you the uh, picture of Gladiator here, uh, where we see uh, he's in jail in the... Um, this is actually him in jail in the Colosseum prison. Uh, but the accuracy critique that I, I'm going to be reading out was he was criticizing the Moroccan prison. Um, I don't know if you can see what the problem uh, with this particular set piece is. Uh, I'll let you examine it for a little moment. Just to see if you can uh, spot what the problem is. <laughs> 
Uh, I'm going to assume you haven't. So if we look at this one in more depth, in the Moroccan prison, the iron bars are electric arc welded. And as a blacksmith, you can easily spot the difference between electric arc welding, a modern technique, and pierced bar joinery such as the Romans would have used. Uh, this seems to me a really bizarre uh, accuracy critique uh, that actually only works because the uh, person criticizing it, uh, he or she is a blacksmith. Um, I would never have noticed. I've seen that film a gazillion times, including uh, the weeks before preparing this lecture, and would never in a million years have noticed that it was the wrong kind of welding. It's an example I like to quote uh, a great deal, alongside another one which I think shows the extreme that you can go to where uh, leaving the cinema after watching the very first Lord of the Rings film when I heard someone, there's always someone at the cinema who's the uh, historical expert for that, whichever period you go to, uh, leaving hearing someone complaining that the armour was wrong for the period, which... I mean, which 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 period are we talking about here? Um, I don't know. You know, which period was, was right for uh, for Gandalf to exist in? So, more seriously, while it is good fun to kind of poke holes in these historical films, and there are lots of historical films you can poke a great deal of fun at. Um, this approach can actually lead you to a dead end because if you take it to its logical conclusion, we realize that the entire film is an anachronism. Um, and so, once we take that basic principle at to heart, we recognize that the entire film is an, uh, an anachronism, we realize we're dealing with a world in which every detail has been constructed using modern methods, or even in those cases when they're not, they're interpreted always, always, always using a modern mind. We do not have a time machine to go back into the past with a camcorder and capture everything. And in any case, even if we did, it still wouldn't be accurate, because somehow it would have lost its immediate significance, meaning we would need someone to interpret things for us. Um, so, uh, you know, um, we see this all the way through time travel films that we always need someone there as some kind of judge who is able to to read that specific meaning in the past and understand it and interpret it to the modern viewer. And we, we often think that that kind of time travel, uh, you know, if you think of a Connecticut Yankee falling through time or, or Bill and Ted's uh, excellent adventures as they bring people backwards and forwards through time, in every moment you will find a local judge who is able to explain to you uh, what the significance of the, the historical period is. Um, so um, even if we take a film more recently like The King's Speech, which took place since the invention of the film recording, if we were to recreate that film simply by screening newsreels dug up from archives, um, that still wouldn't give us real history because very few of us would understand the characters taking place there. We would, we would probably not understand that that there was kind of a, a very early period of hand cranking the cameras, which makes the kind of characters jump around, or that they were using sixteen frames per second rather than twenty four or forty eight that we might see in contemporary cinema, and that therefore makes see, things seem either jerky or it looks like if you probably if you've seen these early films it looks sometimes like people are moving in you know in slow motion or like they're uh, everyone moved a lot faster in the past than they do now of course that's not true it's the the technology is getting in the way or you might think that everyone no matter whether rich or poor lived in some kind of pampered bubble because you don't see any litter anywhere but you'd need you know you'd need to know a lot about the fashions and the styles of your age to understand who was rich who was poor who why people would wear the things that they wear that a particular kind of hat or way of wearing trousers or way of rolling up sleeves was signify a particular profession or belonging to a particular group or so on. So in short, we would always need some kind of prologue to guide us in the past world. And we've seen with Braveheart what kinds of problems historically uh, using a prologue can cause. So does that mean if all films are inevitably an anachronism, does that mean we should, you know, reject all films? Categorically not. Um, we just simply need to understand that in film, as with written history, there are always inaccuracies when it comes to representing the past. That's why it's called representing. So if you think, um, for instance, that um, the written records that we have always need to be interpreted somehow to the, f to the modern world. But if you're making a film, you've got to do a second level of interpretation. If you think about it, um, if you have a record that says the king rose as king sat in his chair signed a document and rose across the room to greet his baron right it's a very simple sentence but you need to know you know 
what the king looked like, how tall he was, um, sitting in his chair, whether it was a chair or a throne, what the chair would look like, what kind of things might be on the throne, what kind of colour it would be, what kind of uh, positioning that chair would take in the room. You need to know what the room looks like, what's on the wall, what's the floor made of, what's the wall made of, what's covering the wall, what's covering the floor, who else is going to be there, how many barons might be there, who is the new baron, what does the baron look like, how would he walk, was he uh, was he taking long strides, did he limp, Do you know, did, was, he, was he carried? You need to know huge amounts of information about every aspect of that room in order to make a film so there is always some kind of inevitable anachronism so what we need to do in the most useful way of understanding films is to try and get behind the ideological kind of um, underpinnings of that film so if we think about um, historiography in the epic film uh, we can take the words of Maria Wyke for instance when she's talking about ancient Rome where she says historians should try to understand not whether a particular cinematic account of history is true or disinterested but what the logic of that account might be asking why it emphasizes this question that event rather than others now if we start to take that approach we can get into really interesting territory and this is my suggestion of, of well this is what I'm trying to do with my own research into historical film when we start to think about how history is put together, then we have to start always taking into account the perspective of the historian, him or herself. Do we need to wonder how much history... So should we reject history? No. But do we need to wonder how much of this history might be influenced by an extreme viewpoint? Yes, we absolutely do. And this is what we should always do, because this is what an historian actually does. And it's the entire point of historiography. So as the wonderful historian E.H. Carr argues, this is the fundamental principles of historiography itself. He says, history consists of a corpus of ascertained facts. The facts are available to the historian in documents, inscriptions, and so on, like fish on the fishmonger's slab. The historian collects them, takes them home, and cooks them and serves them in whatever style appeals to him. This is pre-woke uh, car, so whatever style appeals to him or her. Now, if you think about what that process is doing, what do we got here? We've got the coll uh, collection, assembly, and presentation. These are the fundaments of filmmaking, and these are the fundaments of history in and of itself. So if we think about films abusing history, let's reflect on that process of doing history. Selection, assembly, and presentation are exactly the kinds of things of, that historians do and that is innate to historiography. So when we come to think about it that way, we start to think that maybe analysing historical film in terms purely of accuracy or inaccuracy is not the most profitable way of doing it. What if instead we, we analyse it in terms of degrees of inaccuracy? See, even just separating it into different kinds of inaccuracy already reveals new ways of thinking about the epic film. For instance, you could take degrees of inaccuracy into three levels here. You could say, perhaps on the first level, we might have errors or goofs or anachronisms or continuity errors. Um, these might be things like arc welding or the wrong type of hat or Henry VIII as a kind of a well-craft metrosexual to serious errors, um, which might be kind of... Um, changing the narrative in some way or changing the historical record, as we see in Gladiator or Braveheart. They might be things like giving Henry VIII an extra wife or depicting the French aristocracy as uniquely and universally benevolent. Um, but they could also then veer into the third level to ideological positions where they're extreme ideological repositionings, such as, uh, for instance, there are retellings of the Tristan and Isolde story, the medieval romance, which are retold under the Nazi government uh, called Le Tierno Retour in 1940, uh, which actually vilifies any kind of non uh, able bodied people. And it's a deeply rooted fascist film, like the film 300. Um, we might see uh, the films in the 1950s or 1960s which depict Saxons as uh, pagan proto-communists under McCarthy witch hunts, which are deliberately re-mixing uh, uh, historical narratives together. And we also see things like um, 300 or Spartacus, and I'm not going to get onto my particular hobby horse about the film 300, um, but if you actually rewatch that film now, uh, for even just 14 years after it's being made, and realise the extent to which it prioritises and privileges the perspectives of white, able-bodied, Western European men uh, who are heterosexual and uh, in no way 
uh, what, who were in every way supposed to be kind of this idealized male figure. You can also compare those to a filmmaker called Leonard Riefenstahl, who makes this film called Olympia, which is actually available on YouTube. I think for piracy and legal reasons, I can't link to it, but I'm pretty sure you're able to search YouTube for Riefenstahl and Olympia. Uh, that, uh, yes, I'll put the note, uh, the name of the filmmaker into the notes here. Um, but what we see then are we see errors on one level, we see narrative changes on the second, and we see ideological changes on the third. And those are very different kinds of errors. So the first are usually mere trifles and won't bother most people except those who are particular specialists in that era or have too much time on their hands or just a fast broadband connection. Worse, those kind of first level errors could distract us from the real historical problems of a film. The second level is the one that's more interesting. And sometimes the narrative lies, but sometimes that narrative can have, lie can have a really interesting result. In Gladiator, for instance, we know at the end of the, of the film, and this is a spoiler, but I'm going to assume most people will have seen Gladiator. Uh, if you haven't, then there's a spoiler coming in the next sort of five minutes. Um, so the next sort of 15 seconds. So in Gladiator, at the end, Maximus kills Commodus in the arena. Uh, and then they carry out his body and uh, it's suggested that the uh, that Rome will return to a republic in accordance to Marcus Aurelius's wishes. Now let's leave aside the fact that this didn't happen and just think about them carrying him out the arena in order to reinstate the republic. This did not happen. Commodus was actually killed, um, but he was strangled by a wrestler amazingly called Narcissus. Uh, and he was succeeded by a puppet emperor called Pertinax, which is an, another wonderful name. Uh, and the Roman Empire actually went from bad to worse in 192 to 193. So the narrative actually creates a situation where not only is it wrong and inaccurate, but it creates a situation where it might affect our understanding of Roman history and succession beyond the life of the film. And I'm going to suggest that that's something a bit more difficult to reconcile. But the third is the potentially the most dangerous. When those ideological constraints or positions cause us to retell history or refuse to see history in the factual positions that it actually occupied. So notorious examples of this can include the birth of a nation, where D.W. Griffith's representation of history ends up celebrating the Ku Klux Klan, and the film is credited with reviving the, the Ku Klux Klan to the fever pitch we saw in the late 1930s and early 40s, which continues today. Um, but actually, at the time of, uh, of Birth of a Nation coming out in, 19, in the teens, um, the, the clan was basically, um, to all intents and purposes, dead in the water. So it's not Griffith's point, but nowadays white supremacists watching the film will see their version of the world corroborated and see that race hatred saved America from, from collapse. And in the context of um, geopolitics now and a particular election taking place in the next few months, you will see that this actually has a really deep, deep um, resonance uh, throughout all kinds of levels of society. Other examples include Eisenstein's October, Ten Days That Shook the World, or a host of films made under the Nazi government, for, the, for example, the Riefenstahl or the Eternal Retour, to which I've uh, referred already. And modern day examples include, as I've just mentioned, the fascistic film like 300, which fuels those anti-Arabic feelings by depicting wholesome, buff and whiter than white Spartans as Europeans' logical forefathers, vilifying the Persians and implying that the modern war in the Middle East is simply a continued attempt to save the West from torturous and corrupt barbarians who threaten our way of life and are permanently pressing at the edges of empire. So we can see that this kind of third level changes is, is a result of the first and the second level. And we see it running all the way through bad history, like um, conspiracy theory videos that you can find on YouTube, like uh, Loose Change, for instance, which is a, a, a conspiracy theory documentary uh, lasting almost 90 minutes about 9-11 being a cons uh, conspiracy and an inside job. Actually, once you start to tackle the first level, then the second level starts to crumble and you can unpack the ideological constraints. But simply ridiculing history by saying it's inevitably inaccurate will miss you getting to that third and important level. So all of this shows that sometimes we need to simplify history in order to communicate it. And it explains why a given filmmaker might, even if she knows it's inaccurate, deliberately falsify a specific historical moment in order to gain authenticity at another level for the benefit of the majority. So it's authenticity for the majority rather than accuracy for the minority of historians in the audience.
So the serious filmmaker's priority, whatever we might wish it to be, is to communicate the experience of living in the past, even if they actually have to lie about the details. Sometimes we need to change the past to make a point about the present. And in film, sometimes that history must be invented. And this is what Lukash, George Luke, and Georg Lukas calls necessary anachronism, and it's missing from the slide. But he calls necessary anachronism those moments where, as I'm paraphrasing, we use a lie to tell the truth about historical reality. Now, that does seem complicated, but sometimes we actually can see these things happening. So one example uh, which I've written about elsewhere is an authenticity paradox, where we might use a lie to tell the truth. So uh, when I was uh, watching Life of Brian a, a few months ago, it prompted me to think about Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Now, as many of you will remember, throughout the film, King Arthur is dressed in a tabard and chainmail. And this is a lie on two fronts. First of all, uh, if King Arthur did exist, he would not have been represented by a son. Arthurian literature, Arthurian literature tells us that the son would be Sir Gawain, who, uh, to continue, Monty Python is not appearing in this film. Second, however, and more importantly, the chainmail wasn't real, but we know it was actually made out of grey wool loosely knitted to make it look like chainmail. And here we end up the world of the authenticity paradox, where we have to use a lie to tell the truth. The problem is that real chainmail is really heavy. And because we in the 21st century or 20th century are not used to it, it would severely restrict our movements, making it seem stiff and wooden. Whereas a knight who wore it would have been used to it and as fluid as usual. In the same way as some people can walk perfectly naturally in high heels, whereas others who aren't used to it uh, would actually find it very difficult. Or some people can jump on a bike without falling off. Other people who aren't used to it would not be able to act on a bike uh, in a natural way. So um, in order to make this train mail seem real you have to actually make it deliberately false and this is the kind of necessary anachronism it's a lie in order to tell the truth um we we do this same thing with uh with history too in the history text only it was on the page so we're less obvious we, we're more used to the idea that might be metaphorical uh, and so again that's a, a question of what echo calls the tyranny of the text and the problem of the visual another example uh is uh, King Richard I, who exists, as I've written elsewhere, as a semiotic paradox, where we use the signs to indicate uh, a lie, which is in actually inevitably going to tell us the truth. So if we examine representations of King Richard I throughout film for over the last sort of 60 to 70 years, what we see is a curious phenomenon, which is that he gets older. Um, so in Robin Hood films, so uh, Robin Hood, of course, almost certainly did not exist, but had he existed to serve under King Richard I, he would have had to exist between 11, uh, 1191 and 1199 when Richard I was on the throne. So uh, we know that Richard I ruled from about 35, 33 to 39, and probably the period that uh, we like to now associate with Robin Hood, he would have been about 35 to 39. However, his cinematic counterparts are almost always played by older actors. So uh, if we go um, uh, for top right, clockwise from the top right, sorry, anti-clockwise, we have Ian Glenn at the age of 44, so fairly close. Richard Harris in the top middle at 46. Uh, George Sanders, sorry, uh, Ian Glenn is the top left, 44. Richard Harris at 46. George Sanders at 48 in the top right. Peter Ustinov uh, as uh, 52, who's not there. Patrick Stewart at 55 in the bottom left. And even Sean Connery at 61 in the 1991 uh, Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves film. Um, so what we see there is a process of him steadily getting older. Why would you do that? Can they just not read a history book? No. If you think about the age of 35 to 39 in the late 12th century, you've got someone who's actually survived quite a great deal and made his way, lived long enough to become a king. So that's something like middle to late middle age. It's not quite right. It's very simplified. But more or less, it gives the idea of someone who's not a young king because someone who's 35 now put into a film as the king would seem like a young, vivacious king. And that's not the point that they're trying to make. They're trying to make the point that he's an absent king. They're trying to make the point that he's kind of weakened and so on. So they're using these kind of visual lies that they know not to be true in order to tell a kind of a broader historical truth about what it would have felt. So then if we come back and apply this kind of authenticity paradox to Braveheart, we come towards my conclusion, which is where I'm going to finish. If we apply those three levels to Braveheart, we can see... Uh, something weird happening. We can see that on the first level of the level of the accuracy, we can see the kilts and the lakes and the haircuts and so on. These are lies that are used to tell the truth. They are not the actual locations, but the filmmakers could easily have researched that. Uh, I'm not going to say a Google search because it'll uh, 
uh, it terrifies us uh, from a specific generation and uh, to know that you know Google wasn't around here when Braveheart was being made but they could have easily found out that he's from Paisley right uh, and so they use the, bra- the the bagpipes they use the lochs and the hills and the highlands to tell the truth of an idea of Scotland as a beautiful unspoiled area of the UK to conform to our ideas and more importantly to a US idea of what Scotland and what the Scottish people look like the second level is the narrative, which makes Wallace's actions even more important and ultimately defeats the, the English. So another m- mistake that he makes is he's supposed to sleep with the Queen, as I've said, Isabella of France, wife of Edward II. And so this seems to be an ultimate revenge against the English by fathering the next king of England. Of course, the problem is, as I've mentioned earlier, he's supposed to have slept with her after the Battle of Falkirk in 1298, and Isabella was born in 1295, making her three years old. Wallace died in 1303 when she was eight, so obviously this this is just either hugely problematic or uh, simply untrue. But the uh, the, pro- the of course the the broader narrative shift makes it seem like a broader narrative win across uh, uh, sort of over the centuries that eventually uh, dynastically he gets his revenge. Many of the errors outlined in the first part of this lecture, however, fall into the last category of the ideological prism through which Gibson's viewing Scotland's medieval past. So by saying that uh, historians will call him a liar, he establishes from the very first words spoken an essential polarity between Scotland and England, which by implication continues to this day. It also suggests that whatever you may have heard is not true because history is written by those who've hanged hanged the heroes. So the surviving story is all propaganda, firstly from the perpetuation of a kind of uh, an oppression of Scotland and secondly from the suppression of anyone who could actually tell the truth. So this, uh, by downgrading Wallace from a knight to a farmer and by taking on these ideological shifts, uh, Gibson is doing something very clever and it's quite probable he knew what he's doing here. He's appealing to a perennial underdog principle and suggesting that Wallace was one of us and one of us or one of the USA. In fact, He's merely continuing the ideologies of previous films like The Patriot, in which the English come to represent imperial colonization and unchecked aggression all over the world. And this is the level that has the most effect of the film, since it can directly affect it. I mean, not only is the question of Mel Gibson as an Australian filmmaker challenging the imperial uh, English aggression a really interesting nuance uh, to, take in, uh, to take into account, but also we have the direct effect, which uh, some historians call the Braveheart effect. Um, so uh, the film comes out in 1995 and David Martin Jones, Colin MacArthur and Nicholas Haydock have all argued that debates about Scottish independence ero- which arose in 1996 and eventually led to the devolved parliament in 1999 all had something to do with kind of um, the debates which uh, Braveheart was playing on. It's not caused by Braveheart, Braveheart but Braveheart is playing on those debates. So um, we see this this kind of Scottish devolution and Scottish independence referenda as an ideological reinterpretation by an Australian appealing to the American tourist industry. Now, I'm one who, of Scottish heritage and I fully agree with the fact that the independence debates should take place and I'm not saying it's necessarily a bad thing, but I want to finish by pointing out one thing from the perspective of epic films. Here, in this fraught and utterly absurd level of um, inaccuracies from the historical perspective, we have a case of an inaccuracy on all three levels, which is far more important than what kind of uh, kilt Wallace or tartan Wallace might have worn. Here we have a lie used to tell a uh, a lie which ultimately tells the truth, which has a direct ramification on the ways in which we understand the present. Therefore, the reconstruction of the past directly Uh, uh, underscores or undermines our construction of the self in the present so have great fun figuring that one out Um, I've put uh, some questions in your seminar worksheets and should you have any questions then you can contact me on the email address that I uh, included on the first slide and which I'll leave on the last slide here for you now thank you very much